You are now entering the world of Musings of a Geek Podcast Network. Stay geeky, my friends. Now this here is hard to swallow, but if you do, it's like hitting a lot. Was that weird for you? <laughs> a little bit. You didn't like that? <laughs> That's fine. You didn't get a little aroused? You're a little too good, though. <laughs> that way. I blow the microphone. You get a little turned on, do you? Uh, I don't know about that, but... <laughs> testing, testing! Oh, uh, fucking Jay's testing. You love fucking love testing. Test it, bitch! How's my test? Test it at a good fucking level. How's my testicles? We know you're fucking louder than that, you ginger they have piece of shit! Them? They have lumps in them? Your boobs? I'm not my testicles. No, definitely no one's testing those. That's your own damn fault. Boob, boob test. I'll do a boob test. They look pretty perky. Not any closer? Do I, to, do I need to get him close for my fucking testicles, bro? Do, do, please do not put the mic to, phone, to your fucking tit. T- right here, bro. No. Uh, right God here. damn it. <laughs> God damn it. Luba, Luba, listen up. Listen up and bring on the antibiotics. It's time. It's time for... What the fuck's the name of that show again? How to do this water? What, what the hell does that even mean? How do you feel about anal? The program you are about to hear is long. Thick and hard to swallow. Consider yourself warned. Now, your host, Jay Bidwell. Thanks, Deacon. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hard to Swallow. I, of course, am Jay motherfucking Bidwell. I say, of course, not because you know who I am, but because I'm a self centered prick who likes to think you do. Ah! Today's show, though, we're going to do something a little different. We're actually going to jump right into the interview segment. Uh, ran a little long with comedian, writer, and all-around good guy, Lucas Corvada. So we're going to run the gamut of conversation with him. Grab your beer, make a new, new cocktail, whatever the fuck your poison is. And here we go with Lucas Corvada. Hi, man. How are you? I'm good, man. How the hell be you? I'm doing quite well. Excuse me, my parents, so uh, I need to smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> you need the weed to uh, deal with Madre and Padre? Yeah, and I think they need some to deal with me, so eventually they're going to break into my stash. <laughs> what, so where are you visiting to then? You're, you're in New Mexico? Yeah, I, I actually live in Santa Fe, but um, I'm hanging out with my family for the summer. They don't live very far from me, but uh, I've been traveling a lot and got back from a two-month vacation, a two-month road trip, and um, not ro- I shouldn't say vacation, but a two-month road trip. Were you doing and comedy on the road? No, actually, I um, I did I did stop in Nashville, make some contacts out there, got me a new manager out there, uh, Tennessee, uh, that was in Tennessee, and then North Carolina, I met up with a writer, director, friend of mine out there, and I uh, was doing some work on a script, so it's been, you know, uh, work. It's been work, but it's also been fun. Play on the side. You know, you've got to have your play time. <laughs> now, Lucas, I, I know I'm not outing you here or anything, but I do believe that you are my first uh, openly gay guest here. I, I'm sure I had a million closeted guests on this show. And for a show called Hard to Swallow, it seems like we would have done it way before 105 episodes. I, I thought, actually, I thought that um, with a title like that, you would have gays flocking to you. You would think, but I... Because we have no problem uh, with hard or swallow, so... I am an asshole, though, and I, I do tend to make some gay jokes, but they're never derogatory. But I think I think that some people, they, they can't laugh at stuff like that. I, you know, it's one of those things where you have to be able to laugh at anything. It's stand-up comedy. Um, I don't get offended by it unless you're really an asshole, and I don't think you are. Um, oh. If you are, I don't think you'd have me on your show, first of all. But uh, it's like race jokes. You know, people use race jokes all the time, and you just have to remember that stand-up comedy is part of race, is part of life, and it's one way to get through it. That's know? the best part of having black so, friends, is they give you that, that card. They're like, all right, you can make the black jokes, but if anybody else does it, I'm punching them in the fucking white neck. <laughs> you get an open game. You know, it's, it's open game, you just go for it. And uh, be, at, be where the ball falls, you know? It, you're quite active in the gay community, is that right? Yeah, I am. I, I am quite active. I used to write for a gay magazine called Pride and Equality. It was uh, a gay magazine published by Monthly. I just think they were confused. But um, <laughs> I, did that. I did a lot of traveling for... <laughs> I did 
did a lot of gay traveling, a lot of gay reviews, and um, aside from that, I also produced and uh, hosted a reality pilot called Blue Collar Coach Work, and it's really taking gay into the workplace, and if there's any place that there needs to be equality aside from marriage, uh, it's also the workplace, and uh, that was one of the reasons why I created it, and I did it uh, three years ago, I created that pilot, and it's right now being under, under consideration with a major network. So hopefully it goes through. Uh, it is my baby. I love it. And it's really showing that, hey, somebody who is much different. The problem is I was on film sets and I was working with people who became really good friends of mine. And they always thought I was a city boy. They didn't think that I grew up on a farm, that I knew how to do things. And so when I start telling them, oh, yeah, I know how to ride a horse. I know how to saddle it. I know how to do these things. And they're calling bullshit? Yeah, and they're like, what? You can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I know how to drive a tractor. And so um, so from that, I just said, hey, why not show them that I really know how to do stuff? And uh, when it comes down to it, I'm sometimes more masculine than some men. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> if Mike Rowe left Dirty Jobs and they, they gave it to um, Ross Matthews? It really is. It's taking a fish out of water and putting him in bleach situation, <laughs> you know. It's really uh, creating that awkward situation. And um, it was fun. So right now, uh, we're actually going to start an Indiegogo campaign, a Kickstarter campaign. So if the network doesn't come through, uh, I can do my own and, and put them out there because so many people have said, we can see to watch that and we want to see more. When's your next one? So, um I've had so many people tell me, ask me when's the next one. So I want to do that, and, and it's fun. So. And you, you know, of course, you hear all these ridiculous statistics um, related to suicide rates for lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgender. Not to get uh, too serious on you, but I just wondered, in your opinion, are we at all a- approaching a world where acceptance or even tolerance can put an end to that fucking ritual? No, I don't believe so. I got real uh, deep on you, real I, quick. I know, my apologies. <laughs> No, uh, you know, I, I wish I wish I could say, in all honesty, I wish we could, I could say that that we are going to put an end to that, but to those statistics. But um, no, I don't think so. I was in I was just in North Carolina, spent about a month and a half, two months there, and we're in America, and people in North Carolina are having to live closeted lives, and that's not the type of person I am. First of all, I, I don't know if I'd be able to live there. Because, first of all, my comedy is not that. I am not that. My family accepts me. My nephew, who is nine years old, posted something on my Facebook wall that said, I hope you never change, Funky. And it was, you know, about, uh, it was something about being gay and, and, and family members accepting him. And he posted that on my Facebook wall. So, from my perspective, I am very well accepted from my family and different people, uh, the people that are around me. But I've been to places where that is not the case. And places like North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, the deep south, um, places like that, they still had issues with it. And I think as long as, as there's those pockets, um, it's going to be an issue. I mean, race was still an issue 40, you know, 30 years ago. It was still an issue in those areas. So uh, they're very, uh, I don't want to say closed-minded. I think they're just very sheltered. Uh, places like that are very sheltered. And what I always try to tell my nephews and nieces is get out and travel the world, go experience, um, go off, look at different cultures, accept different people for who they are, never judge them because you don't know, uh, never judge somebody because you don't know the situations that they've been in, and uh, and just accept people, and that's the type of family I was raised in, that's, which is beautiful. That is beautiful. You, I, I've talked to a lot of people um, who are afraid to come out because they know that their parents would react negatively. So for you to grow up in a family where you were so comfortable doing so, or maybe you weren't, but they were completely accepting of who you are, you fucking lucked out. Well, you know, I lucked out after the fact, because before I came out of the closet, my family always had, it wasn't negative remarks about gays and lesbians, but the thought was always negative. I was raised in a very Christian, ultra-conservative home, uh, the joke is that our parents didn't let me watch Ellen DeGeneres, but they let me watch Dookie Hauser, and at night I'd go home and jerk off to him. But, um, <laughs> anyway, uh... And that so, was before anybody even knew he was gay. Nice work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Neil Patrick Harris, which I, I met him, great guy, I met him twice while he was filming, um, 
uh, uh, the only way to find the West here in Santa Fe. Uh, and I've got jokes about him, but anyway, I'll get to the real meat of what I was telling you. I left to L.A., I was out there, and I came out of the closet to my friends out in L.A., and I was coming back home, and and my fear was coming out to my family out here and what they would say, because they're all conservative Christians, and there were always these bad things, of negative things or negative thoughts that were said about uh, gays and lesbians. So when I came out here, I thought, you know, geez, and they always told me, my friends in L.A. said, you always have a home here, you always have family, you'll never be homeless or without loved ones, we will be that for you. So when I came back to New Mexico, I came out to my mom, and of course I had to, you know, buy a case of wine, get her drunk, uh, <laughs> threw it under the stars so I couldn't see the, the disappointment in her face, I was worried about that. And when I did it, she said words to me that were so beautiful, she said, I always knew you were gay. I just didn't know if you knew. That's, you hear that a lot, too. Find that out for yourself. I, I know I know a lot of people too who say that um, yeah everybody knew but me and it's that weird that weird that weird moment of is he gonna accept it is he gonna become aware of it anytime soon or we gotta keep playing this game exactly and I have an aunt right now that is going through the same thing she um she came we were chatting one day went over to visit her uh, from one of my trips and she said you know I think my son's gay and I I said you know I think he is too but. I didn't want to take it, I didn't know how you'd react to it. And she said, oh no, you know, I, I kind of knew, um, not from when he was born, but around that time, you know, he just started developing these, these and the attributes. And she said, and I hope he is, because then I'll have somebody to go shopping with. And I thought <laughs> it was so awesome that, um, that my aunt was so accepting of her son, who is now six or seven years old. Uh, whatever he, whatever he, Whatever his preference is, or whatever he leans towards, she was accepting of it at such a young age. And uh, and I hope that other people have that. I think it's the moment it happened to my mother, it touched home, and her ideas about being gay and, and her thoughts about it completely changed because it was not something out there that... that it wasn't just somebody out there. It wasn't just a friend or a friend's child. It now hit home. It was now her child. It was now in her home. And how is she going to deal with it? Was she going to reject me and throw me out? Or is she going to be that parent that said, I love you regardless of whatever you decide to do or, or whatever you decide to love. I just want you to be happy. And so she chose the higher path. What age were you when you when you discovered that you, you might be gay? And how many years did you end up hiding it? Oh, God, you know... Years that went by, I didn't come out of the closet until I was 23, 24 years old. Uh, around that time, I think I had just turned 24 years old. I had experimented before that several times, probably uh, three or four times within maybe three years before that, so about 20 years when I was about 20 years old. But um, yeah, it's about 20 years old. And but leading up to that, I had always been attracted more to the masculine, uh, masculinity. I'd always been more attracted to it. I remember the first time uh, I was walking behind my cousins, and I've got two, two cousins around my same age. One of them was a little bit older, kind of beefy, kind of hot, jock type. And we're walking behind him, and my cousin said something that pissed him off, his brother, <laughs> and pulled down his pants and mooned us. And oh, I no. every single time I wanted to walk behind him, just hoping he'd moon us. Um, <laughs> it was, it, that, I was about 12 years old, and I remember thinking that that was the first time I'd ever seen uh, a guy's ass. And, you know, I'm 12 years old being attracted to it. Uh, the first time, though, uh, there was any real firm, definitive point of me being uh, gay or, or feminine was... I was in preschool, I was about four or five years old, and I dressed up, they had these wardrobe things, hats, you know, boots, everything, you could be a cowboy, you could be a fireman, whatever, you choose whatever field of work you want to go into. Well, in this chest at school, there was a dress and there were high heels, so I put them on, it just felt natural to me. Um, I don't know if I was going to be a showgirl, if I was going to be a prostitute, what I, you know, what area of... <laughs> Prostitutes are way more fun. Profession I wanted to go into, but um, they 
took a picture of that and sent it to, and made a card for, for Valentine's Day and gave it to my mother, and I still have that card with that picture somewhere. No uh, shit. Of dressed in high heels and dressed, yeah. Wow, that's pretty fascinating, actually. See, it's weird to think, too, that someone that young could even start to comprehend that there might be something a little bit different, you know? And the way you say, I, I saw a man's ass, and I liked it, is just like someone like me, you know, going to the football games and hoping the cheerleader's dress would jump up a little bit so I could see the panties. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> you're right. It's you finding the Playboy magazines in your uncle's garage, which yeah. we found a ton of them around that age, and it just didn't do it for me. You know, boobies just didn't have... They didn't... Um, they didn't hold that attraction for me. They, you know, I didn't go bonkers over it, um, but I did over a, a, a cute white ass. <laughs> <laughs> did you end up dating women in the past then? I did, yeah, I really did. I played the straight card for quite a while uh, growing up in church. Um, growing up in a church where I have four relatives that are pastors and, and ministers, uh, you kind of fall into this pattern of, this is what you're supposed to do because this is how you're raised. And when you're going to attending church functions of some sort, at least four, four nights a week, and being um, in a private, in a Christian academy, you fall into that, uh, this is what I'm supposed to do, this is who I am. And when I started branching out and, and you know doing things that were not church-related and seeing that while there is this whole different life out there that has nothing to do with religion, um, and going to bars and clubs and, and hanging out with normal people, doing things that normal people do. I'm not saying that Christians aren't normal, but, um, you know, for the most part, they're not. And it's okay, I believe in aliens, so I'm not normal either, but whatever. Um, you're just, I started deviating and, and, and seeing different um lifestyles, and, and that's really when I developed my own and said, you know, this is who I am, and this is really who I am. This is true to who I am, not just because somebody said, this is how you're supposed to be, <laughs> and this is what you're supposed to do. Fuck, I've said it many a time. I wish I, I wish I was gay. I wish I was attracted to men because bitches are fucking crazy, man. I can't, <laughs> I can't seem to get the shit straight. But uh, what is the main differences between dating a man and a woman? Um, besides the obvious, of course. <laughs> well, besides the obvious, tits and, and pussy. Um, yeah, the know, smell's I a little different. It, it's easier to, uh, I would say in the beginning, it's easier to, to let go and say, okay, fine, there's no attachment, it's sex involved, and that's it, there's sex. And, and I'll pay my way, you pay your way, I don't expect him to pay for me. He doesn't expect me to pay for him. Uh, that was in the very beginning. Shit, I never thought. I never even I, thought about that too. And you, you have a partner with the same sex drive. You ain't gotta talk the woman into it and poke her in the ass every morning. God damn. It. <laughs> right. It's just like you want it. You know, it's something. It's something that you want. And that's the one common denominator across the board that I have been told from straight guys is Lucas. You know, we love living vicariously through you. We <laughs> think you're hilarious because we don't live that life. Uh, but we can relate to you in certain ways because gays love sex, they're men, and they love sex just the way any straight guy does, and so um, maybe even more so. Uh, so that is the one thing that I can relate very well to any straight guy, is the fact that they don't get off to any uh, sex joke, whether it's straight or gay, they, they love it. <laughs> and... Um, and it's a really cool thing because we have that in common, and and that's why straight guys are usually and, and straight women are usually my best audiences, and so are actually lesbians. Those are the three uh, straight men, straight women, and lesbians. Gay men sometimes are like, okay, you know, we've been there, done that. Tell me something that I haven't done, you know, like I haven't, you know, so I have to keep coming up with things that they haven't done, you know, like vodka enemas, which. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, um, read, you read about that um, shit and you go, Arr? Yeah, you're having to always push the envelope. Uh, but with these other areas, um, it's really interesting. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, dating, not straight guys, but dating uh, guys, um, that part is easier. But when you actually start getting into the meat of it, uh, then you have the issues of 
that make it more complex, like meeting their family. Are they out to their family? Uh, did they have kids from a previous relationship? That's always a hard one. Kids and divorce, uh, that's a tough one. You know, and, and I dated a guy who was went on three dates, and he told me he was married. Oh, and I was fuck. like, whoa, calm down, you know, because my heart is starting to actually like him, actually starting to like him, you're married. And then um, that night he sent me a text and said, I, I came up to my wife, and we're getting a divorce. And it happened that quickly. And um, and that was way too fast for me. That was something that uh, even me from as a third party, uh, I, that was way too quick. And... And he moved into that way too quickly, but uh, a buddy of mine just plan. buddy of mine just had that the opposite way, where his wife realized she was lesbian, and they've now they've now parted ways. But he was only with her for like two years too, and it's like God, how do you how do you marry marry a man if there's even the inkling of of, of that in you? It's like it, it, that's it, because society tells you that you are one way, and you're supposed to be one way, and and so you fall into that's the same thing that I fell into being raised up in, in, a, in a Christian, um, in a home that wasn't accepting, is I had to be a certain way in order to be accepted by those that, that I was surrounded by. And so when you start getting outside and seeing the world and seeing that, hey, it's okay to be yourself, and that's what that moving to LA did for me, um, that's when I started developing my own personality, my own character. And I've always had, you know, been funny. I've always been able to be outgoing. There are certain qualities that a person always has. But uh, choosing my own lifestyle. And people say, well, you weren't born that way, you know, whatever. I don't care if I was born this way. I was born this way, definitely. I know that for sure. But even if I hadn't been, this is what I prefer the most. And why should I be denied my right to choose what I want to do in my life? And, so, uh, and that's what it basically comes down to. I don't care about whether I was born this way or not. So um, have you I, completely I, shed religion since then? Since uh, obviously oh, they're definitely. not too accepting. Yeah, you know, um, I think that the, one of the worst things ever is, uh, and, and I don't really have this with my family there, they're really accepting of, of me in terms of my, they're more accepting of me as, in terms of my lifestyle than they are of me that I don't believe in Christ, and um, and I believe that we are all part of the universe, and that when you kill something, uh, that goes back into the universe, and everything gets recycled, our, our souls come back again. Um, anyway, that's just my belief, and, you know, it's out there, whatever, uh, but, um, I have, yeah, I have, because I think when somebody tells you this is the way you're supposed to think, this is what you're supposed to do, that's when it screws up a person's mind. Uh, when you're telling somebody what they need to, how they need to think, and how they need to believe, instead of saying, go off and experience for yourself, and then come back. You know, go yeah. off and experience for yourself, and then come back and judge for yourself what feels most comfortable for you. Because in the end, we don't know. In the end, you know, there's nobody that knows. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the afterlife. And um, where I'm at spiritually, uh, not religion, but spiritually, feels comfortable for me, and I'm okay with it. If somebody else is, is not okay with it, that's fine. But um, this is where I'm at, and they accept me or they don't. Not Thankfully, to... I've got parents that uh, they're like, yeah, he's, he's off the rocker, but it's okay, we still love him. <laughs> yeah. Not to mention, it's uh, got to be hard to find solace in a book that basically says that if you're homosexual, you should be killed. That's another thing, you know, that's another thing. The Old Testament is really fucked up in that in that way, but I do have to say the New Testament is a little bit different. You know, Jesus had 12, 12 disciples. Um, any man who is uh, having drinks with his buddies knowing that after dinner he's going to be getting some wood has to decay, I'm telling you. So uh, <laughs> I think Jesus and I are kin, and, uh, and I think we speak the same language, cock. Which is great. I don't mind it at all. <laughs> Not to mention, one in how many are gay and he had 12 disciples? I know, right? There at <laughs> least has to be. There has three to of them. Exactly. <laughs> wow, we really, we really fell down this gay rabbit hole, didn't we? I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess maybe we should talk about more things. I got. I actually got one question. If, if you promise you won't be offended. No, no, go for it. <laughs> so, as a straight man, how, how do you decide who's pitcher, who's catcher, or do you flip flop? How do you. It's not really a thing of, of how do you decide who, it, that's another complex 
issue for another <laughs> show about day, gay dating is, um, aside from the fact that you know you're eventually going to have to meet their family and all that jazz, um, before you even get there, you want to know who if you're compatible or not. You know, if you're the uh, positive or minus end of, of or negative end of the battery. Um, <laughs> you know, who's Ooh. doing the charging, who's doing the receiving. Um, that's a complicated thing. It's not something that you... See, I never uh, get to make that choice. Goal. See, I always wondered, like... That's easy. It's, yeah, it's easy. It's like, it, the fucking... It's written. It's written in the sky. Easy. Read the fucking manual. You can right. do this. Watch a porno. You learn. But, yeah, I always wondered. It's like, wow. Is it, is it, is it more masculine and feminine? Or is it more uh, power play? I'm, I'm just... I don't know. Uh, there's, you know, guys that are, that are versatile. And uh, uh, most of the time when people see, you can automatically assume when you meet somebody like me and my stature and and my level of, of femininity that I am a catcher, so to speak, or bottom. Um, I'm, I'm, I am more of a bottom, a versatile bottom, but uh, it's a hard one. You can't tell. Uh, sometimes you just can't tell, and, you, and it's something that you have to learn from a person. You ask them. <laughs> uh, there's uh, straight people have tender. Gay yeah. people have grinder. Yes, yeah, so if you've got grinder, one of the things that you ask if you're going to do a hookup uh is, um, you know, are you top or bottom or versatile? And then, but for dating, I think that's a little bit more uh, complex. It's not something that you just say, oh, you know. But you do want to find those things out about your partner. You want to find out if you're compatible because you might not be, you might be best friends. <laughs> I've got a bestie. He's now living in Rome. He's uh, <clears throat> been there for about a year. And we grew up together since we were about six or eight years old in church. And we're both uh, we're both bottoms, and and you know we're the best of friends. We're, we can hang out with each other every single day, and and, and uh, we have fun adventures. But when it comes to sexual compatibility, we don't have we're not sexually compatible, which is fine because we're besties anyway. Um, and we get you know talk about our 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 uh, sexual ex- expeditions, but. Um, yeah, so it's something that you you really just have to find out by asking the person because you never know what uh, or you can date somebody and they can be versatile. You know, I've dated guys that are that are versatile, but because I take more of that bottom role, uh, that's what I that's why I feel most comfortable. So. Speaking of besties, maybe you can maybe you can clarify for us straight guys why why every girlfriend we've ever had has a gay best friend. <laughs> it seems because we we <laughs> we love to go shopping. We will be honest with her and say, girlfriend, those shoes just don't work with that <laughs> eyeliner. Um, Whereas their you know, boyfriend comes out their boyfriend comes out and goes, yes, honey, it looks great. Let's go. It looks great. Let's go. Come on. We're running five minutes late. <laughs> In my case, I'd keep her back another five minutes just so she can change her shoes and look even better. <laughs> um, but also, we get to talk about uh, things that, that we get to talk about, you know, like was, how good was he? Do you think he's gay or straight? That's, I've had so many girls at a bar or after a show asking, mm. you know, I think my boyfriend's gay and no, I, or no. I think my husband's gay. I'm just not too sure. I can't tell, but he does these certain things and and then we investigate it. And, uh, and so we talk the same language, basically, especially when it comes to sex and they feel comfortable with us and they know that we're not going to hit on them. Uh, I've slept with more hot chicks, models, I mean, these are gorgeous, beautiful women. I've seen their tits. I've touched them. Uh, I've touched more tits than most men. I never ask how much they cost, but they look gorgeous on them. <laughs> and Jealous. And the honest got truth. Uh, I had one girlfriend, one friend, that she got a breast implant, and the first person she told was me, and she said, you know, after they the swelling went down, she said, touch them, tell me if they feel for real, and if they feel real. Uh, another one got them pierced, got her nipple pierced, and um, and she was pregnant. And I said, well, you better hope that kid doesn't kick, you know, because otherwise it can knock out an eye. But anyway, she got her nipple pierced, and I was the first one to see her nipple being, her nipple pierced. And mm-hmm. they feel comfortable. They know that I'm not going to get a heart on with them. They know I'm going to be honest. And um, Yeah, but can you describe it to me? Because I wasn't there. That would, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, you see, I'm sorry, I'm making me jealous. I'm not kidding. I've, uh, that's why I have more straight friends, because they're like, Lucas, you are the best gay magnet. You walk into a room, 
and guaranteed by the end of the night I will be friends with all the women there, <laughs> um, especially if they're dressed well and I'm dressed up for it. So I, I, I do this. <laughs> Uh, so it's good to know that other straight people do this too. I clearly I am because I've asked you so many questions about uh, just gay life. But it seems like every straight person, when they meet a gay person, they kind of make them the ambassador of all the gays. And it's like you know everything there is to know, so you enlighten me. So that's... that is fine. I will be your mentor. <laughs> um, that that is sort of the uh, the thing is once you get that, uh, once they find out about that. Uh, you know, straight guys just love you, and, and and that's the best thing. I've got a very good friend. His name's Lauren, and he's he's uh, my straight boyfriend, I and mean, we hang out like buddies, and um, and we can talk about anything. And there's no, you know, maybe at one time there was something that I had for him. I think he's, you know, but man, we're friends, and I don't want to destroy that. And I think a lot of the, a lot of straight guys kind of worry about getting hit on and. You know, what if he's going to But if he's a true friend, he wants to keep that friendship. I want to keep my friendship with, with Lauren, and Lauren wants the friendship with me, so we don't cross that line with each other. Uh, now, Lauren's asked for a threesome before, but, um, <laughs> you know, I don't think that's ever going to happen because he wants a chicken ball. So, uh, and he's not willing to compromise, and neither am I, but, uh, but we're buddies, and um, that's a fun thing when I can be friends with somebody and be so... Uh, so far from each other sexually, you know, there's no attraction, oh. uh, but be best friends. I understand that you got to work with uh, Mini-Me himself, Mr. Vern Troyer. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy to say that he is straight, he's not gay, he's, <laughs> right. he's straight, but he's a great guy. And I was introducing, introducing him at a comic, at a comic con uh, thing, and after the show, we went out and we're, we're having drinks, and he's sitting on the bar. And, you know, he's two feet, eight inches tall. Right. Last time I saw two feet and eight inches, I was on my knees at a glory hole. But, um, <laughs> I digress. So we're sitting at the bar, and a fan recognizes him, rushes up to greet him, steps on his hover rounds, which is scooped up, by the way. It's got, like, these ultra-awesome fenders. <laughs> the fan breaks his fender. And I say, way to, way to break a, a small guy's car, or way to, break a, way to break the fender off a small guy's car. And he thought it was funny, and he said, Lucas, that was a great joke. Let's fist, you know, fist pump. Let's fist. I want to fist you. And I said, Bernie, you don't want to fist me. They'll never find you. <laughs> and uh, he just thought that was the funniest thing. And earlier that night, I introduced him at uh, Battle of the Band, and he dared a guy $500 to drink a tub of red chili. And the guy drank it. And after the show, I asked him, Bernie, was it hot? He said, oh, yeah, Lucas, it was super hot. I stuck my finger in it, spun it around, and tasted it was super hot. <laughs> and I said, Vern, I hope you didn't stick that finger somewhere else. Talk about a burning ring of fire. And he's a great guy. Uh, we played blackjack that night, or throughout the weekend. This was a week, five-day weekend gig. And uh, we were playing blackjack, and I actually won $500. Um, I had run out of my money. I had run out of money. I was going to go to the ATM to pull out more. And uh, he threw me a $50 chip and said, here, don't, you know, here, Lucas, you don't have to go. And so I stayed there, played 50 bucks with his money, and, and, and from that $50, I won $500, gave him back his 500 or gave him back his 50 rather, went to the craps table with uh, Linda Pizarro from Operation Repo and some other, um, Noah Hathaway from uh, Never Ending Story. We went to the craps table. Uh, I just laid down chips, you know, they really hadn't played craps before. They didn't know how to do it. Oh, it was roulette. This was roulette. I'm sorry. They're playing roulette, laid down the chips on, on the roulette table, and ended up winning uh, altogether $800. Goddamn, son. It was a pretty flipping awesome night. And, um, yeah, he burns away as a very nice guy. Uh, he seems like a real party animal. I, I remember seeing him on The Surreal Life, and he was. they were all amazed at how much that boy partied. He's all naked, pissing in the corner and shit. They're like, God damn, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think he can... You know, I didn't see him, I never saw him pissing. Um, I, I would have inspected to see, you know, if everything was proportioned. But, um, I would be curious myself. I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't get, uh, I didn't get that far. But he's a great guy, nice guy. Uh, you know, I, yeah, that is with a weekend with the Vern Schreier. So <laughs> it's really fun. What what has been your most memorable moment in the, the business so far? I mean, besides that one, obviously. 
you know, there's there's several of them. When you're working, I worked on a project which, which hasn't come to fruition, but um, I worked on a, I was co-creator of, of a reality show that we're, we're still working on, so I can't release the name of it, but we had to do a pilot. And just getting to the stage of producing that pilot took us about, I think at that time, I think I'd worked on it for about a year. Me and my co-creator, uh, his name's Chris Rainey, and, um, and he's, he's doing some other pictures, some other uh, feature films. But um, when you work on your baby for a whole year and you're putting all your money and resources and especially your time into something that may never happen, but you got, we got to the point of uh, filming the pilot for it and just being able to sit back. And I wasn't part of it. I wasn't talent. I was uh, just, you know, a co-executive producer and creator of it. And we brought in a director, stage director, and the whole bit. You know, we had the whole thing set up for this production. And getting to that point, and you can't express it. It's like probably, I guess the only way is like a mother seeing her child being born. <laughs> we got to sit back and see everyone do their job, everyone run their, run their department, and sit back and see our baby developing. And it was so amazing to have that experience. Um, and there have been so many others like that, performing comedy. Uh, I'd like to say that the first time I performed comedy, that's what I felt. But that's not true. It's every single time that I get up on stage. And as a comedian, you will have amazing times on stage. You will be able to make people laugh and get, make them laugh, get them there to that place of just, uh, somebody called me, she, she called me in January, she had seen me perform about eight months before, she was, uh, she's infected with AIDS, her husband gave it to her, he was going around, gave it to her, oh, and she called me on the phone and said, Lucas, I just want to tell you that in some of my lowest moments, I go back to you performing stand-up comedy, and you're making fun of yourself, and you're okay with you making fun of yourself, and I'm okay laughing with you, but I got out of my own mind, out of my own life, for that time that you were on stage, and I wow. just got to enjoy life, living through you. And, um, and when she said that, that when she called me, I'm, you know, when you have people calling you like that, and, and somebody, another friend of mine, he's still in the closet, he's having so many issues, um, He's called me three or four times. Usually he's, you know, drunk. It's hard for him to deal with, the, with that issue. Uh, him coming out because his family is not accepting. Um, but he calls me and says, Lucas, you're a great person for being so small to cheat. And you get on stage and you, you're saying all these things that are funny and people are laughing with you and they're laughing at you. Uh, that's, that's, those are great moments, you know, to see people laughing. And I don't care if it's at me. Go ahead, laugh at me. It, you're laughing. I am confident with who I am. And I can take it. I can take a joke. You know, I can take people roasting me. Sounds but, like you've, uh, you've found your laugh. dream gig, basically. You get up there and not only can you entertain and make people laugh, but you can inspire. That's that's pretty much what anybody fucking wants, whether they know it or not. If you can change somebody's mind yeah. or somebody's uh, day for the better, what the fuck? If it's a better day for them, it's a better day for me. I, I think we're placed on Earth in different lifetimes for different purposes, and I damn well hope that my purpose in this lifetime is to make people laugh, because that's the only thing I want to do. I never, I can never see myself ever retiring from comedy. I don't care if it's, I don't care if I'm a drunk ass fool at a bar drinking when I'm 90 years old. I hope the people next to me are laughing their asses off at whatever I've got to say. <laughs> and I hope their life is much better because every time I do that, my life is better off for it. It's great. It's a great life. It's just living authentically to who you are, being true and honest to who you are for your, you know, in yourself. And, and people are going to love you. They're going to hate you. But in the end, it, you have to live with yourself. Are you still writing for the Medical Marijuana Journal, or was that in the past? No, I wrote... Um, I wrote for two issues for the Medical Marijuana Journal until it went bankrupt because they smoked their profits. Um, <laughs> well, hey, rolling, uh, rolling papers ain't cheap. Rolling papers not cheap. No, that's right. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, it was made of, uh, of hemp. So, um, no, I wrote for two issues, and 
I was most uh, recognized because of that magazine. And How the hell did that even come about? It, did you just, you found the magazine and were submitting articles by uh, freelance? No, uh, that came about because they hosted, the Medical Marijuana Journal was hosting the uh, Medical Marijuana Expo. Oh. And they wanted entertainers, they wanted stand up comedians and entertainers for the weekend uh, of this expo. And I used to um, cast, and, and I was associate producer and co-host of a TV show for CW called my, uh, called Duke City Comedy League. Okay. And so uh, the powers that be for the expo contacted me and said, we want comedians, can you help us book it? And so I booked all their comedians, and they said, and, and we've you know got this magazine that we're doing, uh, which reminds me of Provada's Comedy Corner, writing for it. So they came to me and asked me, and uh, I said, sure, you know, this is this is great. They were running about 100,000 magazines, um, a publication, and for each publication, and it was great. And I'll tell you, I got, I didn't even know the issue had been released, uh, the first issue, but I got off, uh, I was parking my car in ballet, I was somewhere, I don't remember what hotel, parked my car ballet, the guy, ballet guy opened the door, I got out of the car, and he said, hey, I know you. And I'm like, okay, from, you know, where? And he said, I think I saw you on the, I just read your article, Medical Marijuana Journal. And mm-hmm. it had just been uh, released on, on newsstands that, that same day. I didn't even know about it. And people everywhere were like, hey, I read, usually they were like in that voice, hey, man, I know you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no shit. They're not Visine spokesmen, that's for fucking sure. Right, yeah, uh, it's very interesting because I have I've got comedy bits. I've got bits of material about uh, about marijuana and, and writing for the, the uh, writing for the journal. And um, after every sh- single show, it never fails. I've got at least three or four stoners coming up to me and saying, "Hey, here's some weed, man." And uh, oh, you want to buy some weed? <laughs> damn it! I hate free drugs. Oh, usually I gotta pay for it. It's so much more rewarding. Not. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's one of those things that. Just because it's free doesn't mean it's beneficial. I had to learn that in my <laughs> life because everything is offered free in, in this business. And so, uh, yeah, I just have to pace myself. I want longevity in this, so uh, I've had to tone it down a bit. Uh, I see you got some dates coming up for shows and such. You want to tell everybody what they can look forward to, where they can find you? Yeah, I don't have too much from now to August. I'm working on a couple deals for, for films. I'm, I might be working on a film in between that, but... The month of August, for two weeks, I'll be in Cleveland, Ohio, for the Gay Olympics. Oh, wow. Uh, leave it. I know. Leave it to gay men to turn water sports into an actual sport. <laughs> but, um, so uh, I'll be in Cleveland for, for two weeks and uh, hosting and performing. I don't have specific dates, um, but I will be there for, for that entire event. And uh, after that, um, the month of October, I'll be filming... Uh, in fact, we're releasing a Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaign for Autumn Harvest. We've got the budget is around 130000 We're liking about 45000 So uh, it's an indie film, and uh, it's about vampires. It's a really great script with a different twist, and uh, vampires are still in. And, Twilight um, didn't scare so them away yet, huh? No, in fact, it just uh, perplexed it. <laughs> to be honest with you, I was just meeting, uh, having coffee with a friend of mine, his uh, Ben Nye, Ben Nye Jr. from Ben Nye Makeup. They make the, the makeup for the film industry, and, and he gave me a magazine, uh, the makeup magazine, and on the cover is a vampire. And uh, he, they're not they're not going anywhere very soon. I mean, these vampires have been around in film and pictures since the 1920s, if not earlier, right around when film was made. They've been in books. Uh, they've been immortalized in books forever, so they're not going away. In fact, it's just um, uh, with True Blood and and Supernatural and different uh, TV shows like that, it's just getting more and more popular. So expect to see that. But so I've got that in October, and also in October, I've got the Santa Fe Comic Con, where I will be hosting uh, the after hours events and and uh, and doing some MC work for them during the day. So anyone out there who has never been to a Comic Con, this is be a great experience, or even if you have been, we've got great talent, you can go to uh, Google Santa Fe Comic Con, it's going to be in October, and they're really fun, you know, the people that, that come to them, the celebrities that come to sign autographs, they're there because they want to be there, they're, they're there to see their their fans that love them and adore them, 
and uh, come by, take, auto take photos with them, and get their autographs. Great people. This year, I introduced Corey Selman from The Lost Boys and from Stand By Me. I introduced him twice, and then um, that was a Thursday and, and Saturday night show, and also uh, G. Tom Mack, he's a composer of Lost Boys and works a lot with Jerry Bruckheimer Productions. Um, great guy, awesome, talented, uh, one of the best in Hollywood for, for musical composition. And uh, that was him this year. Um, also Johnny Nitro, he is a wrestler. Great guy, worked with him. Um, you know, and, and, and there's other celebrities who are just out there for their fans. Most, some of the times they don't even, you know, sometimes they don't make money. I worked on a gig with uh, uh, Kathy Coleman. She was Holly from Land of the Lost. Okay. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, blonde pigtails and great, amazing person. And that show didn't produce any money for anyone, but she was out there for her fans. And uh, this is the 40th anniversary of Land of the Lost, so that, that'll be great. And uh, who else? Uh, last year was Vern Troyer, Minnie Me from Austin Powers, and um, Jason David Frank from the Green Power Rangers. He was there last year. He's here this year, too, but I didn't really work with him. Con, so, con folks are, are some of the best. They're, they're really fun. And you can tell right away when you walk into a convention which celebrities are there for you and which celebrities are there for them. And uh, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll either meet your, your hero and you'll be like, oh, my God, they're everything I hoped, or you'll go, fuck that piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's only been one individual that I've ever worked with that I, uh, I hope I never have. And I won't mention his name. Um, because I may have to work with him again, and, and we've got the same manager, but um, I, you know, I said to myself, I hope I never work with him again, because I'm here because I want to be here. I'm in this business, and, and I'm getting paid peanuts for it at the moment, because I love working this industry, and it fits my personality so well, that if at any point in my life, it, it, it was, I was not having fun, and I was not happy, I could make more money right now doing other things. And um, and that's really the truth of it. Uh, I used to be a script supervisor in films. I did over 14 projects and three commercials as a script supervisor. And it's basically behind the scenes. It's all behind the scenes. And it's keeping track of continuity and so many different other... I won't even go into the detail of it. But um, I got tired of it. And I started hating it. And um, my motto used to be the worst day on the film set still the best day of my life, and one day that changed for me when I was working as a script supervisor, and I said, I don't like this, and it makes money, it, I could do very well in that in that department, uh, probably better than I'm doing right now, but when you hate something, then you just become a better person, and getting up for work isn't the same at three in the morning, you know, it, it changes you, so... It's certainly an industry that you, when you first get into it especially, you, you're not doing it for the money. You're doing it for the love of what you're fucking doing, just like you said. Because it, it, for a lot of us, it takes a lot of fucking time and a lot of fucking effort to get through to where, you're you, where you want to be. Yeah, you're an actor. You know exactly what it's like. If you're not, if you don't love it, I remember when I started out as a background actor and somebody was bitching about being a background and they're like, you know, and, and after hearing that for about, Six hours. We were on set. You know, we're on set for god awful hours. Fourteen hours, sixteen hours. You know, it's, it's not. Um, it's not what you think. You know, you're freezing cold. But you need to make it look like summer, or you're uh, hot as hell, and you need to make it look like winter. You know, there's all these different scenarios. And I had, you know, I got. I told him. I said, if you don't like it, you should leave. This, this, this is not for you. If you cannot stand to be a background actor. You know, first a background actor, and that's how I started out. If you can't stand to be here at the lowest level and work your way up, then you shouldn't be in this business at all. I think that's how anybody sure. starts. And I actually, I just got a, had a buddy of mine hit me up, and he goes, "I got a part for you coming up." And I tell my friends, and of course, always the first thing they ask is go. They ask is how much are you getting paid? And I'm like, you know what? I don't even ask. I, I never ask. I will do a film for free every day. For for now, that's just I love it so fucking much. I, I would do anything to be on a film set, but that's always the first thing they ask is, "What are you getting paid for this?" And I go, "Nothing." And they go, "Well, that's fucking stupid." And I'm like, "Fuck you." <laughs> There's times um, now where, where I'm because I you know I do do the writing, I do the acting, the stand-up comedy, and I'm producing um, Autumn Harvest and, and trying to get Blue Collar Couture 
uh, picked up and trying to be creative in, in wanting the network to see it and pick it up uh, that I really don't have, and I've got some other reality projects as well that, that we're working on, I really don't have the time to uh, to do free gigs anymore, to do free stuff, which is, sometimes those are the most fun because you get to bond with people in, the, in a different way. Um, I don't have the time for that right now, and I've got a new manager out of Nashville that is booking me for, uh, we've got three or four things right now that, that hopefully will come through, but um, you know, I've had to really stop and say, okay, I need to pick the projects that I want to work on. I need to pick my own projects and invest myself in those, and then the other projects that I get called for, uh, I need to um, make sure that I am getting paid because I need to make a living. And um, But I remember the days of just being able to do it for free, and it was fun, you know, be, hanging out and just filming, being on set, and doing it guerrilla style, you know, like insurance, yeah. what's that all about, you know? <laughs> You know? The cops, uh, the cops show up and go, "You got a permit?" And you go, "What the fuck is a permit?" I'm, uh, oh. <laughs> right. Well, I, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, if you need a talk to officers. Uh, that guy over there, and then that guy transferred him to somebody else. We'll go talk to this over here. Yeah, that was. Those are fun days. Those are fun days. Uh, I thank you very much, Lucas, for joining me today. Um, everybody, make sure you check him out. Uh, you can find him on Twitter. What was your Twitter handle again? Lucas Corvada. Uh, oh, easy. My, Website is lucascorvada.com. Yep. Facebook, uh, Lucas Corvada. Uh, I am the only Lucas Corvada around, and if there is another one, then um, he better watch out. He better not be an actor or a comedian, because then we've got some real issues. Sag's going to be like, nope, sorry, bro. There's already one. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> good luck with everything. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank, thanks, brother. Have a good one. Yo, yo, yo. This is Jay Bidwell here from jbidwell.com. Check out Hard to Swallow, your new favorite comedy podcast just here fuck fuck gangsta's hard bro it's hard being a gangster they right it's hard out here for a pimp that's why they want a fucking oscar for that shit damn jbidwell.com j unit that's gonna do it this week everybody this has been another edition of hard to swallow make sure you find us on itunes stitcher uh couch potato nation.com musings of a geek.com and of course, our home, jbidwell.com. If you want to be a guest, find the contact form, the guest form. Find anything you could want to ever know about this stupid-ass show and all the stupid-ass people who are involved. Mainly me. Ah. Huge thanks to our guest, Lucas Corvada. And make sure you check out his website. You can find Lucas on Twitter and all that fun shit. But we'll be back with some... Some new stuff, I think, next week. Uh, it's been pretty busy around here. That's why I keep these interviews. That's why I do this. So that when I run out of time in my real life, I can go, Hey, look, I got some backup content, motherfuckers. What? Have a wonderful night, everybody. I'm Jay Bidwell telling you to go fuck something. We interrupt this amazing podcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Your mother's a whore. <laughs> More at six. Seriously? What fucking year is this? Ah! Who the hell are you? Uh, Jeremy. From Married with Podcast. From CouchPotatoNation.com. You asked me to do this? <laughs> oh, right. That podcast where you talk to your wife. You know, most dudes actually spend eternity trying to avoid conversing with their wives, but I guess your way works too. Uh, why did I agree to this? <clears throat> you know what else is bomb ass? Oh, God. Well, according to the script in my hands that you wrote, I'm supposed to say, Speaking of podcasts, don't you run a podcast too, Jay? A funny one? The funniest one I've ever heard? Jesus. How many special needs kids wrote this shit? Just read it. <sighs> Hard to Swallow with J.J. Bidwell is your one-stop shop for filth, celebrity gossip, and Jay's twisted take on current events. Now available on Stitcher, iTunes, and of course, CouchPotatoNation.com. You know, that's an excellent point, Jeremy. And if you want all this, minus this jackass, Married with Podcast is for you. 
You, you know, let's actually just stick to the lines that are written. Uh... <sighs> CouchPotatoNation.com. Awesome, funny, and judgment-free. <laughs> Your mom is free. You know what? Fuck this shit. Hey, th- wait, where are you going, bro? Go fuck yourself, Jay! <sighs> Damn it. You are now leading the world of Musings of a Geek Podcast Network. Stay geeky, my friends.